The goal of measuring dietary intake for individuals is to identify nutritional problems and then develop strategies that can either resolve or at least improve that nutritional problem for that individual. The U.S. government has similar goals. Many federal departments will measure dietary intake for the U.S. population, along with a variety of physical and health status variables, and they can use this to identify trends, risk factors, and emerging health problems with the goal to implement public health policies and prevention strategies. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, and the Center for Disease Control and Prevention are three federal government uh, departments with long histories of collecting food, nutrient, and health data. We are going to review and use two major dietary intake data sets for the U.S. population. Now, terminology around this is not always consistent between all of the websites that we're going to go to, but I'm going to define and use two terms in distinct ways for this class. The first one is consumption data. We will define that as data that's collected from asking individuals what they ate, what they consumed. This is going to be compared to disappearance data. Disappearance data will be defined as data collected by measuring food supplies moving from production through the market channels for domestic consumption. It disappears into the commercial and retail food marketplace. It's a popular proxy for actual food consumption, but it does not actually directly measure what food is eaten. Let's start with the most common consumption data set available measuring dietary intake of the U.S. population titled What We Eat in America. This data set comes from a survey conducted in partnership between the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. It is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or more commonly called NHANES. NHANES is considered the cornerstone for national nutrition monitoring to inform nutrition and health policy. It's designed to assess the health and nutritional status of adults and children in the United States. The survey is unique as it combines interviews and physical examinations. Demographic, socioeconomic, dietary, and health-related data points are collected. Dietary intake is collected on about 5,000 people each year using two 24-hour recall interviews using the multiple pass approach. The first interview is collected in person, and the second interview is collected by telephone three to ten days later. Reports generated from this data are titled what we eat in America. Here is the website with intake data sets from NHANES. And I'm going to click right in the center of this webpage on the words data tables. And what we're going to find these specific reports from NHANES specifically will have reports from every two year period going along starting in 2001 all the way up to the most recent 2015 to 2016. In Haines program is continually collecting survey data, but dietary reports are generated just every two years. In Haines actually started collecting data from the 1960s, but there was a significant change in the methodology for collecting dietary intake in about 2000, so only those data sets are provided here. As mentioned earlier, data is collected on demographic and socioeconomic information, so that data is divided into those reports. You can have reports around gender and age, you can have reports around race and ethnicity, and reports around income dollars and then percent of poverty. I'm going to click on gender and age to show you a typical report. So these are PDF files and this report is going to have information around gender, males and females, and then different age groups. And you can see that it provides the mean amount consumed by individuals within these groups in the United States between that, those years. It provides it by nutrients, so we have energy, the macronutrients. If I scroll down, you can see that it has the vitamins, and then it has the minerals, and then finally we get to the individual different types of fatty acids. We can use this data then to actually compare between groups. And I'm going to use the comparison of calcium intake between 50 to 70 year old males and females. Inhane reports for that age group indicates the average intake of calcium is 1,068 to 920. Females are averaging 880 to down to 771 milligrams. This lower intake for females takes on more significance when we compare them to the respective RDAs. Just knowing an average intake isn't helpful if we don't know what the recommended uh, need is. 
For males between 51 and 70, their RDA is 1,000 milligrams. They're not too far off from that. For females 51 to 70, their RDA is 1,200. So their average intake is not only lower, but it's more significantly below their recommended intake level. So in summary, NHANES data are consumption data, meaning they get the information by asking people what they eat, and it provides mean or average intakes of nutrients per individual by a specific group in the United States. Now let's look at the other major type of U.S. population dietary intake data set, or disappearance data. These are data sets that are collected by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and they measure how much of about 200 different commodities are consumed or disappear into the commercial and retail marketplace. If we think about cheese, we can go through the basic formula. So every year, our farmers will produce a certain amount of cheese, add that to our pile, and then we think about the cheese that is imported from around the world. Then we add how much do we have in our, our stocks to begin. If we collect and add that all together, that's the annual supply, supply or the amount that would be available for us to consume. But from that, we will export some of it. So everything that we export, we will subtract that from the annual supply. And then we subtract any farm inputs or industrial use. That doesn't make much sense when we think about cheese, but it does if you think about something like corn. We will use some corn from ethanol production, or we would use corn to feed to our livestock. We would subtract both of those. They would not be part of consumption data for U.S. population. And then finally, we might end up with some at the end of the year, so it wasn't consumed that year. So we subtract that export, the farm inputs, and the ending stock, and we end up with the U.S. food consumption or the amount that disappeared into our, again, retail and commercial marketplace. Now notice here, for something like this woman who is purchasing this cheese, that cheese has been put into that data set, but we have no direct observation that she actually ate it, and we're not going to ask her if she ate that cheese. Maybe she's using cheese to train her dogs. Dogs love cheese, and people will use cheese as a treat to train a dog. That would be counted into this disappearance data, but didn't really get consumed by a, a individual people in the United States. So it has some noise to that data set. Despite that noise or that possible error in this data set, it's very useful for observing and seeing changes in our food production and availability in the United States. So let's take a look at it. This is the USDA website with the food disappearance data, and the specific department within the USDA is the Economic Research Service. I mentioned before that sometimes the titles change a little bit, and on their website they actually call it food availability. And food availability represents the amount of food that's available to be consumed for every man, woman, and child. There are three specific data sets that we are going to be looking at. They are the food availability, loss adjusted food availability, and the archived nutrient availability data, data sets. For both the food availability and this nutrient availability, availability tables. These are data that actually from starting in the 1909s and they are based around commodities. So if we look at just the titles of the files, these are all the Excel files, there are very specific titles, a lot of different categories so we don't group them all together. We'll have dried fruit separated from fresh fruit. I like to think of these are the files for food for the food industry and for farmers to see how they're selling the products and how they're producing. So that's two of the files that we're we'll looking at. Again, but both of the food availability, and then they do the math and do all the analysis to get to the nutrient availability. It does indicate here that the nutrient availability tables are archived, and the reason for that is they are no longer updating them. The most recent data is up to 2010. We are going to look at them in our class because they're a great way to compare nutrient available to our population versus the NHANES data where we ask people what they ate and how much it was actually consumed. The other data set here is the loss adjusted food availability. I'm going to scroll down to that. And here are the files and the titles associated with the loss adjusted food availability. This data is newer. It started in 1970s. Two adjustments are made to the food availability data sets when reported in the loss adjusted food availability data sets. First, data are presented in terms of per capita food pattern equivalents, specifically in the units used in the MyPlate food guidance systems. 
where food availability data reports bananas available in pounds per person. The loss adjusted food availability data sets reports in cup equivalents per person. This allows researchers to gain a more complete understanding of the U.S. dietary patterns by comparing them to food pattern equivalents measured in other national and estimations for food intakes as surveys for individuals. The second adjustment made to food availability data in the loss adjusted food availability data is that the USDA will estimate the amount lost between post harvest and actual consumption. These food losses include cooking losses from parts of foods typically discarded during preparation and loss from mold, pests, and inadequate climate control, and then food waste. Food waste is a component of food loss and occurs when edible items go unconsumed, as in food discarded by retailers due to color or appearance, and plate waste by consumers. Now how USDA estimates these losses is beyond the scope of this course. But the final values in the loss adjusted food availability data sets are considered closer to the actual levels that the average person in the United States consumes. This graph compares data from the food availability data sets versus that from a loss adjusted food availability data set. And you can see a few things. Again, the food availability is older. It started in 1909. The loss adjusted data is lower. It subtracted out all of that food loss and food waste. But we can also see that there's a pattern. When the food availability went up, so did the loss adjusted food availability data. So the older data set, that just that food availability that is probably overestimating what we consume, still provides evidence of patterns that are happening with our food intake. So we're going to look at both of these data sets. This table provides looking at all the data put together, the type of information it provides, and then how we can use it to kind of assess again the average intake of the U.S. population. And I've given data around red meat consumption and then egg consumption. So if we look at food, the USDA food availability is giving it in pounds per person per year. Interesting, but not too helpful because I don't have a standard and it's really not going to tell me whether that's a high or low amount. But when I compare it to that loss adjusted, where they've made those two adjustments, they've put it in the units that we understand with the MyPlate, and so it's telling us that we get 3.2 ounces per day, per person, um, of red meat, and about a half an ounce equivalent, which is about a half an egg per person per day, per year. I can now relate that to the MyPlate much more easily. And then we think about the nutrient that we would tie with those specific foods. And we could think about protein. Definitely red meat is not our only source, but it's related to that. We can look at that nutrient availability, saying that for every man and woman and child, we have about 120 grams of protein available. But when we ask people what they ate in that consumption data from inhanes, it comes out to about 80 grams. So that's probably indicative of a lot of that food loss. And then the cholesterol, the same thing. Eggs are not the only source of cholesterol, but it's our primary source. And we have available to every man, woman, and child about 460. But when you ask people what they ate, it drops to 282. So these are our data sets. And we can look at the type of data it's reporting. And we can use it to assess the intake of US population.